Good morning and welcome to Second Parish Unitarian Universalist. I'm Karen Delano and um, we're glad to see people in their pajamas, this being a, a come as you are party. Uh, we'd like to welcome the Reverend Paul Sprecher. Paul retired from a seven year ministry at First Parish in Bridgewater in 2021. Previously, he served as minister at Second Parish in Hingham and a sabbatical minister at the Murray Church in Attleboro and the Chatham Meeting House. In other lifetimes, Reverend Paul taught 7th and 8th grade, U.S. History and English for the Collegiate School for Boys in New York City, and later as Vice President for Technology at the American Stock Exchange. Now, we have a few announcements. First of all, in your order of service, you will find the order form for Easter plants. It's not too late. The date said uh, it's the 21st of March, but we'd be more than happy to have you speak to Julie Hort during our, not coffee hour, or during our super lunch this afternoon. Uh, are there any other announcements? Susan, come up, please. So today we have a special coffee hour, and I hope you all will join us. It's Super Sunday, so we have seven soups out there and lots of other food, so we really need all of you to stay. And during lunch, we'll be talking about um, either what is important about Second Parish or just what is important about church. And if you can share at your table and then share with the rest of us, that would be wonderful. Thanks very much. And Reverend Stephanie is going to be here for coffee hour, and she'll be running a little activity after we eat. So hope you can all stay for that. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? Lisa? No? Okay. Well, if there are no other announcements, then let the service begin. Good morning. Always a joy to be back in this familiar pulpit with familiar faces. It's a, it's a place I was at for seven years, and six months and one day ago, I was married to my wife, Zeph, right here in front of this pulpit. So it's a great pleasure to be back. Today is Palm Sunday, so the words of the beloved poet, Mary Oliver are more appropriate than the words I'd originally chosen. It's Palm Sunday, and here she remembers the humble donkey who bore its rider so faithfully on that Palm Sunday some 2,000 years ago. In her poem, The Poet Thinks About the Donkey. On the outskirts of Jerusalem, the donkey waited not especially brave or filled with understanding, he stood and waited. How horses turned out in the meadow leap with delight, how doves released from their cages clatter away, splashed with sunlight, 
But the donkey, tied to a tree as usual, waited. And then he let himself be led away. Then he let the stranger mount. Never had he seen such crowds. And I wonder if he at all imagined what was to happen. Still, he was what he had always been, small, dark, obedient. I hope, finally, he felt brave. I hope, finally, he loved the man who rode so lightly upon him as he lifted one dusty hoof and stepped, as he had to, forward. Our opening hymn paints a somewhat grander role for human beings down through the ages. Number 114, Forward Through the Ages. Please rise in body or in spirit. Will you come forward and light our chalice, please? <clears throat> Let's join together in the words of our second parish covenant. With love for each other and with respect for each person's search for truth, we unite in the spirit of Jesus for the worship of God and the service of our neighbors. <coughs> Kids, come on down front. And I'll tell you a little story from our, our history as a Unitarian Universalist people. <coughs> so you came as you are. 
And you did How too. Many and all you see now they followed the instructions. <laughs> what about all the rest of you? <laughs> so we Unitarian Universalists have the most complicated name of any religious organization. Did you ever think about that? <laughs> Unitarian, what is that, five? five. Universalist, 10 syllables <laughs> to make up a name. You know, Baptists, two. <laughs> Methodists, three. So it's a complicated story, but it starts for the Unitarian part of our name back in 1819, 200 years ago. And um, uh, Unitarians kind of stick out, they're a little different, like how do you explain this Unitarian Universalist thing? What's a Trinitarian, what's a Unitarian? And uh, there was a big argument in the churches of New England um, this church was founded as what's called a standing order church, which means that it was one of the two churches in the town. There were no other churches. Old Ship First Parish downtown, and then this is in South Hingham, it was called. Glad Tidings Plains, right over there. So we were the second church in Hingham. And then around the 1800s, people started arguing about theology. They started arguing about Unitarian, Trinitarian, liberal, conservative. And um, here's a story from early on, 1819. Uh, it was back in Baltimore, which is where one of our churches was built in 1817. Tall mastered, sh masted ships staled the ocean, horses clip-plopped on cobblestone streets, and two young ladies named Amelia and Emily were walking the streets of Baltimore. It was a nice warm spring day, it was May actually, and they twirled their parasols on their shoulders and they lifted the hems of their long skirts, I have kind of a long skirt, but not that long, <laughs> to step over the puddles of rain. Good day to you ladies, called a gentleman, and he tipped his hat at them and smiled as men. Does anybody wear hats anymore, except caps? Well, they used to have nice hats. Greet the ladies, and Amelia smiled back and said, good day, but when the gentleman had gone by, Emily clutched her friend's arm and said, Amelia, don't you know who that is? No. That is Mr. Jared Sparks. He's going to be the minister of the new church with the big dome on Franklin Street. Amelia gasped. You don't mean? Yes, Mr. Sparks, she said, and lowered her voice, is a Unitarian. <laughs> oh, dear, said Amelia, looking back at the gentleman who was just disappearing, and he seemed like such a pleasant man. Emily sniffed. Father says those Unitarians are all non-believers. Amelia said, but I heard that Mr. Sparks was to be ordained on Wednesday. Emily sniffed again. They may call it ordained, but Father says he would never call a Unitarian minister reverend because they're not proper Christians. They don't even believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Oh, my goodness, said Amelia. Mama said one of their ministers, a Mr. William Ellery Channing, will be coming all the way down from Boston to give a sermon. And a great many other ministers will be in Baltimore, too. This time, Emily giggles. Well, at least no one will hear Mr. Channing's sermon, because in that church that the Unitarians built, it's simply impossible to hear, which is a very good thing. <laughs> yes, it is. That sort of Unitarian nonsense shouldn't be spread around. And with that, the two young ladies continued on their walk, stepping over puddles and twirling their parachutes on the way. Now, William Ellery Channing did come to Baltimore, all the way down from Boston. Dozens of other Unitarians came as well. They held a special ordination ceremony. That's what happens when you call someone to be a minister and they get to be called reverend and they get to wear a stole like this. I was ordained here in 2006 as part of coming to Second Parish many years ago. 
and the Reverend Channing, because Unitarians do use the word reverend, as I do, for example, did preach a sermon that day. It's true that the new church with the big dome wasn't easy to hear in, but over 10,000 people read it because it was printed and sold all around the United States. That sermon sold more copies than any other book or track in the United States in those days. It was incredibly popular. And now, back then, as Amelia and Emily knew, Unitarian wasn't considered polite. People preferred to be called liberal Christians or Congregationalists, liberal Congregationists. But the title of his sermon was Unitarian Christianity. He said, that's our name. Let's use it. Two years after this sermon, over 100 Congregationalist churches declared themselves to be Unitarian. Six years after the sermon, the group of ministers created the American Unitarian Association. They were proud of the name, and so are we. This church became Unitarian back in the 17, 1830s or 40s, and that's how we continue to this day, with that very long and complicated Unitarian Universalist. The Universalist comes later, but... We'll talk about that another time. <laughs> time now to send our children to their classes. Let's sing them out. So we continue with the words of William Ellery Channing in number 592 at the back of your hymnal. I call that mind free by William Ellery Channing. Number 592. I call that mind free which masters the senses and which recognizes its own reality and greatness. Which passes life not in asking what it shall eat or drink, but in hungering, thirsting, and seeking after righteousness. I call that mind free which jealously guards its intellectual rights and powers, which does not content itself with a passive or hereditary faith. Which opens itself to light whensoever it may come, which receives new truth, as an angel from heaven. I call that mind free which is not passively framed by outward circumstances and is not the creature of accidental impulse. Which discovers everywhere the radiant signatures of the infinite spirit and in them finds help to its own spiritual enlargement. I call that mind free which protects itself against the usurpations of society and which does not cower to human opinion. Which refuses to be the slave or tool of the many or of the few and guards its empire over itself as nobler than the empire of the world. I call that mind free which resists the bondage of habit, which does not mechanically copy the past nor live on its old virtues but which listens for new and higher monitions of conscience and rejoices to pour itself forth in fresh and higher exertions. I call that mind free which sets no bounds to its love, which wherever they are seen delights in virtue and sympathizes with suffering. Which recognizes in all human beings the image of God and the rights of God's children and offers itself up a willing sacrifice to the cause of humankind. I call that mind free which has cast off all fear but that of wrongdoing, and which no menace or peril can enthrall. Which is calm in the midst of tumult and possesses itself, though all else be lost. Time for our solo.
for any joys or concerns. Hold them up and the ushers will collect them. All right. Uh, have happy and relieved that my great niece, niece Ada is recovering well from kidney surgery. One more on its way up here. <laughs> You're doing fine. <laughs> okay. Um, it's great to welcome Paul back to Second Parish. Okay. Uh, a story for the death of a young adult child of a close friend and a concern for the mental health issues and the difficulty of finding treatment and support. And a joy. From Zeph Helmer. Six months ago today, Reverend Paul Sprecher and I were married in this beautiful church, and she was wearing a beautiful hat. It is a joy to sit in the congregation and listen to him preach. Thank you. Let's sing Spirit of Life together prayerfully as you remain seated. Mark? join together in a spirit of prayer and meditation. Spirit of life and love which speaks to what is deepest in each of us. We gather again to remind ourselves here of our highest aspirations. There lives within each of us an intimation of better ways for each of us to live and to take our part in the great work of healing the world. We sense that we ourselves each have a part to play. We sense that our hearts can tell us how best to find wholeness in our own spirits and how to extend it to others. We sense that there are new horizons of love to explore and to offer. And we know that we fall short we disappoint ourselves and each other. Sometimes we despair and feel that we're somehow damaged, defective in some fundamental way. So we gather here to remind ourselves and one another that there is more love somewhere, more hope, more joy. We gather to revive that love, that hope, that joy in our midst. May we be reminded here of the richness of the future we can build together, a future where all persons are honored for who they are, where everyone's soul can breathe free, where each person is able to grow into wholeness. To this high purpose, we rededicate ourselves and open our hearts to welcome the ways we can be part of this sacred work. We enter now into a time of silence at the sound of the bell.
Let's join together in the words of the prayer of Jesus from the New Zealand prayer book. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all that is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echoes through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by the peoples of the earth. Your heavenly will be done by all created creatures. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, Spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love, now and forever. Amen. The reading is taken from a sermon by the Reverend David Pyle, given at that very Unitarian Church in Baltimore in 2017, where William Ellery Channing called upon Unitarians to claim the name. He says, as a minister serving a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you can't just buy a car. A few years ago, I was serving as a minister for a medium-sized congregation on the coast of Southern California when the old minivan I'd been driving met its end. I'd never bought a car while serving as a Unitarian minister, and I faced a dilemma I had not expected. Because as a minister serving a Unitarian Universalist congregation, you can't just buy a car. Why? Because several hundred people were waiting to make value judgments about the character of their minister based on the choice that I would make about which car to buy. <laughs> My choice in vehicle would be seen as an expression of how much I was willing to live each person's impression of what a Unitarian Universalist of good character should drive. I was soon being heavily lobbied by the Prius faction of the congregation. Others suggested that I should think about biking the 15 miles to and from church every day, or maybe I should invest the time in taking public transportation, and I should make a commitment to the congregation right now that at a minimum, I would forswear all thoughts of SUVs from even entering my mind. <laughs> when the moment of truth arrived and I pulled into the church parking lot one Sunday morning in my brand new smart car, my moral character as a Unitarian Universalist was affirmed. And there's a theological tension that rests at the heart of our Unitarian Universalist religious movement that unacknowledged can create hurt and harm in our own lives, in our religious communities, in our families, and in our culture. I can best begin to name this tension by telling an old universalist joke. Universalists believe that God is too good to damn anyone to hell. Unitarians believe that they are too good to be damned. In assessing our own worthiness and that of others, we Unitarian Universalists have two theological frameworks that are in tension and that address this question of worthiness differently. They've come to be known as the doctrine of salvation by character and the doctrine of salvation by universal grace. But rather than speaking of them as doctrines, it might be easier to call them instead patterns of thought based on how we assess our worthiness and that of those around us. And in some ways, if we still treated them as doctrines, then we would acknowledge them more, and maybe they would have a healthier effect on us. 
the doctrine of salvation by character, which was expressed by Unitarian minister William Ellery Channing, William Ellery Channing again, in his sermon, Likeness to God, held that it was a person's character that they were able best to use to express their worthiness in this life. A person's ethics, morality, judgment, honesty, commitments to their values, lack of hypocrisy, was not only an indicator of their worth, but was also a way to come closer to the divine themselves. That your actions matter, and that it's by living your values that you are judged worthy before God and in the community of human beings, which helps determine which car to buy. However, there isn't one clear set of values for what living a good Unitarian Universalist life should mean. And each of us is drawn to a different priority among those values. For some, it would be commitment to the environment. For me, commitment to working to avoid global warming best we can. For some, it would be an expression of economic modesty or to racial and gender justice or to peace or to economic equality that my commitments and the expression of my ethical character is different from others can mean that we are in some ways speaking different languages in our expression of our character. It takes intentional work to acknowledge how others are expressing their worthiness and goodness by character, especially when it's expressed in ways different from our own. And that's where the second theological framework becomes important in our religious faith movement, and that's the doctrine of salvation by universal grace, which we inherit from our universalist forebears. The important manifestation of this theological framework for us is that our worthiness, our value as human beings, is assured no matter what our expression of our character might be at a given moment. That even when we fail, even when we are less than we might be, we're still loved and still worthy of being loved. That even if I had shown up to church that Sunday morning in the 24-foot flaming red pickup truck with a gun rack in the back window that I once test drove to my wife's horror, my worth as a human being would still be assured that I would still be worthy of love. You can see how these two theological frameworks, one that calls us to express our worthiness in this world through acts of character, and one that guarantees our worthiness through divine and universal love, might be seen as being in conflict. And in fact, this tension, this perceived disconnect, is often at the root of congregational conflicts. And yet I have come to believe that the tension between these two ideological frameworks of salvation and worth are together a vital part of what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. For it is only by beginning from a place of seeing the inherent worth and dignity of every person, of acknowledging that divine love and light that it is at the heart of each and every one of us, that we can acknowledge such variation in our expression of our values through our character in ways that are healthy. It's only through the assumption of universal love that the Prius people could accept that, even though my smart car was not a hybrid, I still had inherent worth and dignity. For it is only from a place of universal love that we can see the value of our character. Time now for our offering and offertory. Please give generously to support the work of this congregation.
Please rise in body and spirit as we join together in the doxology. When I served as the ministerial intern at Arlington Street Church in Boston in 2005-2006, before I came to serve here at Second Parish, I was very aware of the statue of William Ellery Channing directly opposite the doors of the church, right at the edge of the public garden. Channing was the most significant minister in the history of that congregation and his spirit pervades the place, even though the church itself was built some years after his death. It was, in fact, the first public building built in the Back Bay after the work done to redeem the marsh in 1861. And on the several occasions that I had the privilege to preach from that great high pulpit, that one is about 25 feet above the congregation, I would walk to the back at the end of the service as the great doors were opened and be confronted by the face of St. Channing and imagine myself asking, so Bill, how'd I do? This year is the 244th since Channing's birth in 1780. Unitarian Christianity, the sermon for which he's best remembered, could properly be referred to as a Unitarian Declaration of Independence when he gave it in Baltimore 205 years ago. The New England churches of the day were embroiled in one of those recurrent splits between liberals and conservatives that continue to royal congregations to this day. We've seen it quite recently in the breakdown of the United Methodists and more recently in challenges within the Southern Baptist denomination. Those on the liberal side referred to themselves as liberal Christians. Their opponents initially tried to slander them by pinning the label Unitarian on them, thus identifying them with the yet more liberal English Unitarians. Joseph Priestley, interestingly, the, the uh, chemist who discovered oxygen, was also an English Unitarian minister and came to this country at the invitation of Thomas Jefferson. Channing was the unquestioned leader of the liberal side of the argument, and he finally decided to accept the name Unitarian, but to redefine it as a term of honor rather than opprobrium. He chose the occasion of the ordination of Jared Sparks, that pleasant seeming young man who passed those two girls on the street and took the occasion to claim the name and define it on behalf of its adherents rather than its enemies. He declared, first of all, that the Bible is a human document written by human hands that must be interpreted by tools available to the human mind. If it were otherwise, he said, human beings would not be able to comprehend it, however lofty its teaching. Reason, in short, must be the ground from which we interpret religion. From this, there follow several distinctive Unitarian doctrines. God is one, not several, hence Unitarian, not Trinitarian. Jesus was fully human, though in many ways exalted as humanity perfected. And we think about that humanness today on Palm Sunday when we remember Jesus on that donkey, faithful donkey, 
riding into Jerusalem, hailed as the Messiah who would overthrow Roman rule. But he didn't have any magic, and that was not his purpose that week. Third, that God is morally perfect and would not create humans with original sin, nor condemn any of God's creatures to everlasting torture in hellfire. Fourth, Jesus' purpose on earth was not to die to appease God's wrath, but rather to serve as an example of moral perfection, of high character. And virtue can be discovered in our own moral nature using our conscience and the spark of divinity present in each of us. Now, some of that terminology derives from particular theological controversies that have ancient histories and continue down to this day, but they represent at heart ideas about human nature, patterns of thought that help us understand who we are and what we're here for. Channing believed that humans are not fundamentally flawed, but fundamentally good. And that's echoed, of course, in our first principle, the inherent worth and dignity of every person. He said, for example, that, quote, God is another name for human intelligence raised above all error and imperfection and extended to all possible truth. Or in the words of the first chapter of Genesis, we humans are made in the image of God. In other traditions, this idea is expressed by speaking of a spark of the divine within us. For example, in the Hindu tradition, namaste means roughly, I bow to the divine in you. Channing says, the germs of sublime virtue are scattered liberally on our earth. I cannot but pity the man who recognizes nothing godlike in his own nature. So that is the foundation of Channing's doctrine of salvation by character, that we have within us the means to be virtuous and to know and do what is right, that we're not condemned to suffering and misery because we are fundamentally broken, evil beings, as other theologies sometimes claim. Now, I suspect that like many of you, I have struggled with this theological language, especially the word salvation, which is so pervasive in the Bible and in many religious traditions, including the Pentecostal tradition in which I grew up. I was so troubled by the meaning of the term salvation that I ended up writing my senior thesis in college on the topic. And I was able to make sense of the idea for myself by comparing it to the less theologically freighted language that the psychologist C.G. Jung uses when he speaks of individuation. He suggests that we human beings become divided within ourselves as we forge our personal identities. Of course, as we grow up, we have to distinguish ourselves, differentiate ourselves from our mothers, our families, the people around us, and so on. But in the process, we end up rejecting parts of ourselves that don't fit easily in the rigid separations we impose on ourselves. One of the most obvious example is gender identity that we put on. And in a traditional patriarchal system, Children are raised in strict roles as males or females and are criticized for behaviors that are not appropriate to their gender. So boys aren't supposed to cry and girls aren't supposed to be aggressive, for example. At the extreme, the color of your clothes may seem to be gendered. So that when my son David donned pink in honor of Miss Piggy when he was three, seemed a bit of a dicey choice 40 years ago. Of course, most recently we witnessed a garish explosion of pink in the character of Barbie uh, in the movie and, uh, and since then. So Jung's insight was that these suppressed aspects of our whole selves, he referred to the male and female components as animus and anima, are still within us and need to be integrated for us to become whole. So salvation for Jung then was 
the reintegration of those parts of ourselves that had to be rejected in the course of creating an identity. Itself a necessary process, but not enough to create a truly satisfying life. And I think that our growing awareness of the need to break down the rigidity of our binary gender constructs points toward the possibility of more fulfilling and less fractured lives for all of us. The other insight that I got is that salvation is not a sing about a single moment of being born again, as my family's Pentecostal tradition has it, but about how to live a worthy life each day, doing what is right despite difficulties, stepping as we must forward like Mary Oliver's stalwart donkey. So the means to be saved, the means to become whole and to be virtuous and to live a fulfilling life are in our hands. We have the means within ourselves because we are made in the image of God in Channing's terminology to develop our own character toward the perfection that we imagine when we speak of the ultimate of the divine of God. But what about when we mess up? What about when we get into fights about whose virtuousness is greater than somebody else's? Prius owners, take heed. What about when we get tired and just don't want to be virtuous? That's when the other side of our tradition comes in and reassures us that we are saved by grace, that regardless of what we, are, what we do, we are, all of us, worthy human beings who are loved and who are capable of love. And knowing this about ourselves, we know that it's also true of people who are bad, people who do bad things, think bad or stupid thoughts, or just piss us off. All are worthy. Of course, we can also mess up in the opposite direction. The risk of the character side of our historic doctrines is that it tends toward a kind of self-righteousness, a little bit of smugness that separates from those less enlightened souls who buy the wrong kind of cars or vote for the wrong kinds of people or believe things that are just irrational. This too is a form of imperfection and failure because it separates us from others who are equally endowed with inherent worth and dignity. There's an old story from Unitarian Boston. Uh, two ladies who happen to be Unitarian are talking together and a third comes up to them and says, where is the Unitarian church around here? And they say, oh, the people who need to know already know. <laughs> and then the lady says, and where did you buy those lovely hats? Oh, Unitarian ladies know where to buy their hats. So there's, there's a problem because we always fall short. We are, if we're being honest with ourselves, we always, each of us, mess up and fall short a lot too. So there's always a struggle between our striving to do what is right and persuade others to work with us to do what is right and the complete acceptance the love and grace we can offer everyone, no matter what. That's the tension we have to live with all of our lives. That's the challenge we face every day as we, like that stalwart donkey, step as we have to forward. And here's the good news. Channing tells us that differences are meant to rouse, not discourage. The human spirit is to grow strong by conflict, <laughs> From that point of view, these are very good times for growing strong <laughs> in politics, of course, but perhaps also every so often in this and all of our Unitarian Universalist congregations. Wholeness, or salvation, to use the theological term, is about aligning ourselves as clearly and consistently as we can within the intention between right purpose and love, between justice and mercy, between striving and accepting. My dear friend Rabbi Steve Arnold tells a story. One Jewish man asked the other, does God pray? Huh. Well, the other one says he's a good Jew, so obviously he prays. Well, what does God pray for? God prays that that aspect of God that is mercy will prevail over that aspect of God 
that is justice. We bend toward the side of love rather than judgment. Or maybe more broadly, we could think of it as aligning ourselves with the pulsing flow of life itself, the spirit of life, if you like. It's what the Chinese classic, the Tao Te Ching, refers to as the way, the Tao. The disciples of Jesus in the earliest years called themselves followers of the way. From another religious tradition, Bindernath Tagore, a good friend of Unitarians in his age, a Bengali polymath, poet, musician, and artist of the late 19th and early 20th century, puts it this way in his Githanjali 69. The same stream of life that runs through my veins night and day runs through the world and dances in rhythmic measures. It's the same life that shoots in joy through the numberless blades of grass and breaks into tumultuous waves of leaves and flowers. The same life that is rocked in the ocean cradle of birth and death in ebb and flow. I feel my limbs are made glorious by the touch of this world of life and my pride is from the life throb of ages dancing in my blood this moment. May our lives be such a dance. May we be followers of the way. May we forgive and be forgiven. May we be whole. Amen. And blessed be. Please turn in your hymnals to number 131. Love will guide us. Number 131. Please be seated. The benediction is by Andy Petula. There are miles behind us as a people of faith and many more ahead. As we journey together towards wholeness, may all that is good and true guide our way. May the joy of love lighten every step and the miracle that is life be ever in our sight. Amen.